and, and now we have uh, the mining panel with uh, Sasha uh, moderating it. And Sasha is the US operations and data analytics lead at Kaiko, uh, a digital assets, um, oops, sorry, market data provider. Uh, he carried out research on economics and mining on the economics of mining and Bitcoin and more recently on crypto market microstructure. Previously, Sasha was an aerospace engineer and received his PhD in aeronautics from the Imperial College of London. Welcome, Sasha. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, good afternoon. And it's, it's uh, really a great pleasure to be part of this year's MIT Bitcoin Expo. Uh, always a great event. And it's very exciting to have you all today to discuss Bitcoin mining. You know, every time there is a bull run, mining becomes a very hot topic. A lot of people try to start getting into mining and it's often a very controversial topic as well. It's been portrayed by some media as a waste of energy and there are a lot of other misconceptions out there about mining. But we're very fortunate today to have four amazing panelists, four impactful leaders in the space who are joining me to give you a broad overview of the mining industry. Uh, we'll focus on the institutionalization of mining in North America. Uh, we'll touch on the major trends, of course, energy considerations. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the economics of mining Bitcoin and what it takes to maintain the decentralization of the Bitcoin network. So without further ado, I'd like to um, have our speakers introduce themselves and let's get started with Brian. Sure, thanks, uh, Sasha. So First off, thanks for having us. I've learned a lot so far from the other speakers and panelists. But quickly on my background, I've worked on uh, Bitcoin related projects at Fidelity for uh, many years now. So in 2017, I was working as a strategy consultant on internal projects at Fidelity and was fortunate to be able to work on Fidelity's firm wide Bitcoin and blockchain strategy, um, really evaluated a wide range of use cases during that project. Um, I eventually uh, moved to start working on investment products that are relevant to this type of space before then moving to Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, uh, which is where I work today within Fidelity. So I did research proof of concepts there for about a year, but was quite attracted to mining for a variety of reasons and really wanted to dedicate all of my time at work to mining. Um, so about a year ago, I transitioned to Fidelity's Bitcoin mining team. I've been working there since then, and I'm now a director of Bitcoin mining at Fidelity. Thanks, Brian, and we'll go on uh, to AJ. Well, thanks for having me, Sasha. Really appreciate it. Um, so I, I work at a company called Galaxy Digital. We are a merchant bank that is dedicated to the digital asset space. And I work on the mining team. We do a couple different things. So first, we mine Bitcoin for Galaxy's own balance sheets. So we have a proprietary mining operation. And second, we develop and um, deliver financial services to Bitcoin miners in North America. So everything from equipment finance, where we buy machines and sell them to miners with financing attached to hedging solutions through our trading desk, yield accounts for Bitcoin miners who want to put their Bitcoin to work, stuff like that. Thanks, AJ. Uh, next, uh, let's go with Ethan. Hey, thanks for having us all on. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So my name is Ethan. I co-founded a company called Luxert uh, Mining about three years ago now. Uh, we run mining pool services as well as other hash rate based uh, best price execution uh, products for miners. Uh, as well, we, we built a mining data website called hashrateindex.com where uh, we track various data sets in the mining space, things like uh, the value of ASICs over time or the value of hash rate over time. And so we, we touch a, a few different verticals, both from the operating and data standpoint. Thanks, Ethan. Very excited to have you here today. And uh, finally, the mysterious Jay. Hey, thanks for having me on, Sasha. So I'm Jay Bedek. I'm the director of research over at Foundry. Um, similar to Galaxy Digital, we also offer financial services around Bitcoin mining. Uh, we are pro proprietary miners ourselves, uh, running operations across North America. Um, and then we also have opened up our pool, Foundry USA pool. Uh, where I also act as the uh, product owner for the feature set there. Thanks, Jay. Well, so as you can see, we have a folks from 
really across across the landscape from the uh, the mining operations even to the pool and the financial services that, that go around this. Uh, so why don't we get started with the North, North American landscape? Uh, this year, everybody has been talking about the institutionalization of Bitcoin and with little surprise, this has also occurred to mining. So what does institutional mining even mean? Who, who wants to go first? I, I would I would just start by saying that the biggest uh, distinguisher when you think about institutional mining is probably the most obvious one, which is just uh, scale, right? Like institutional miners tend to be deploying tens of megawatts, if not more at a time. Uh, they're much better capitalized often with, with backing from institutional investors. And th the big thing that we're starting to see, at least in North America is some of these miners have access to public markets. So they've raised, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 12 months to, to really expand their operations. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, AJ. I think if you look at North America and one advantage that North America has over other parts of the world, um, we just have the most robust capital markets. And we've seen that particularly over the last year with just huge, huge uh, flows of capital into this industry. And I think with an increase in capital dedicated to mining, you know, that leads to a lot of other things that I would say fall into this bucket of the inst institutionalization of mining. And so things like financial products and financial services that traditional players would be would be used to having in, in other industries. So products that allow miners to manage risk is, is one example. Um, I also think that we're seeing a maturation of the supply chains that are necessary for miners to work with. Um, so don't get me wrong, procurement of hardware is still a challenge, but you know things like actual more formal secondary markets for hardware, as opposed to just pro procuring uh, machines through things like telegram groups or telegram channels. That's something that to me is transitioning from something that was clearly not institutional to, you know, now there's more, there's more straightforward paths that institutions can actually play in. Yeah. And similarly, I mean, AJ and Brian are, are bang on with that. Uh, you know, the other side of institutional mining in North America is a close relationship with the power generation facilities as well. So uh, where these large scale miners are well capped enough that they can either own those relationships or own the assets, uh, which is something that is relatively recent in, in North American mining scene. Yeah, and actually, uh, Jake, could you expand a little on, on this uh, for those who don't know how the, those operations are uh, managed at scale? Uh, what does it take? Well, how do you get your electricity as, as an institutional, as a large scale miner? So there, there's a variety of ways. I mean, traditionally, you know, if you're thinking about uh, being an individual miner, you know, you're going to be buying off grid and excuse me, off of the grid, meaning from the grid provider. Uh, and there's, you know, retail rates there. But a lot of these operations uh, in North America may look for distressed assets. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, former uh, aluminum foundries, former, uh, you know, hydro dams or hydro dams that are underperforming in terms of generation relative to the demand in the local area. And so uh, mining operations will seek these out uh, and, and look for ways uh, to plug in to that power because it's generally less expensive. Um, they are either buying directly from the grid that's subsidized with these uh, power production uh, assets that is keeping the grid price very low, or more oftentimes they're working what's called behind the meter directly with the power producer uh, where they're able to get a very competitive price uh, for the power that will be then going to feed their their mining operations. Uh, similarly, you can use sort of Bitcoin mining as a, as a demand generator. Uh, if you have sort of a minimum power threshold that you need to maintain, Bitcoin miners are a way to do that profitably rather than just sort of burning uh, whatever fuel you're using, be it you know, in the case of hydro, you're not burning the hydro, but just letting the water spill over. Uh, but it, it's a great way to sort of uh, subsidize the grid there. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue to get into the very hot discussion around the energy considerations of mining. So let's try maybe to debunk, to debunk a, meet, a myth. Um, how wasteful is Bitcoin mining? And you know, how, uh, how is this energy consumption spread across types of energy? Sure, I, I can start with that one. So first off, I do think that you know, monitoring carbon footprint is very important for the world right now. And so it makes sense that we're talking about this. 
But I do think that maybe Bitcoin mining is not the enemy that many make it out to be. I think one element of why this constantly arises is that Bitcoin is just very, very transparent. It's frankly not that challenging to do one of these calculations and, and figure out how much energy is needed to um, power the network today based on current hash rate numbers. Um, that being said, I think that because of because of how transparent it is, it just makes it a, a very easy target. And so I think that you know we need to evaluate um, its energy use versus other industries. I think we also need to accept that ener energy consumption isn't you know, inherently um, a bad thing. And I think Bitcoin is quite valuable. Um, I think it's possible that this is laying the foundation for a future, future financial network. And so it actually, to me, is a feature that something that everyone in the world agrees is valuable, energy is used as an input for something that is then valuable on the other, on the other side where you get Bitcoin out of Bitcoin mining activities. Um, and we should pay to secure the network. I will say, though, also that um, you know, it's clear that renewables are a major, major part of Bitcoin mining today. And I think that's too often also lost in the discussion when we talk about um, the environmental impact from Bitcoin mining. And so um, I think one of the most cited reports is the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finances report, which showed that at least 76% of miners use renewables in their mix of energy. And then they estimate about 39% of total energy consumption comes from uh, renewables. And I think you know, there's probably large margins for error on either side of that, but directionally, I, th I think that's quite right. And I think um, miners are absolutely attracted to the cheapest power sources, but increasingly we're seeing ways where renewable energy actually is that cheapest power supply. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I echo a lot Go of ahead. what Brad said. I think he, uh, he laid it out very you know, nicely there. Uh, I do think that we do have some room to grow on uh, renewable energy mix as well as carbon neutral sources uh, for mining. And so um, it's okay, I think, to admit that it's not perfect yet. But if we can start building products and uh, funneling investments towards uh, miners that are using that in their stack, I think, you know, that's on all of us, you know, on this panel, as well as everyone in the mining industry to, to push to. So I, I'm, I'm pretty bullish that we're going to move that direction. I think it's a natural flow of, of markets anyways, heading towards ESG. And so we need to make sure that we're, we're getting better ourselves because this media narrative of energy consumption in Bitcoin is not going away, uh, whether we like it or not. And so, you know, we, we need to position for the next five to 10 years of this debate. And what do you think of some initiatives of, of acting at the pool level uh, to try and force a more renewable uh, set of energy? So pool level is definitely one way to do it. Uh, Argo and DMG uh, announced a new joint pool that they're going to only allow people who use renewable energy or carbon neutral sources to join. Um, as a renewable energy or non-renewable energy miner, I don't really know the incentive right now to join a pool. Uh, you know, maybe that's like a lower fee or cash back, or uh, maybe it looks better in the media. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that's yet to be determined what that incentive is. But I think there's other ways to incentivize miners to use renewable. Uh, look at like Square Initiatives Fund, uh, for example, they're investing money only into renewable or carbon neutral sources. And I think there's going to be a lot of investors in the future that are taking that into consideration. And so if you want to attract the massive amount of capital that is required to become an institution in the mining space and really you know, scale up your ASIC deployment, then I think you need to start considering uh, you know, what energy sources you're using. And echoing that, you know, when considering the energy mix from a mining perspective, it is more often than not just an economical decision. And as Brian alluded to, you know, green energy or renewable energy is trending towards being the most cost effective solution there. Um, you know, I, I do think looking at it from a pool level, um, it becomes very difficult to manage that. If you want to be a successful pool, you need to have quite a bit of hash rate on uh, your pool. And if you're restricting your hash rate there, the economics become very difficult from that operator side. Um, you know, uh, bef before this, I, I was, I'm a reformed suit. Uh, I used to work, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the sort of audit angle of, of things. And, you know, one of the biggest struggles there to get an ESG friendly investment is to have, you know, third party auditors look at it and provide attestations that this energy source is indeed what they say it is, and it becomes very difficult to do that. I'm not saying it's impossible, nor should it not be tried, but it's uh, it adds a lot of complexity to what is an already very complex process.
I, I would just quickly add, uh, I sometimes worry, uh, fully agree with everything that's been said here on the energy topic. I do sometimes worry that we as Bitcoiners sometimes grant our critics the, the implied premise that energy consumption is somehow bad per se, when the reality is like en energy consumption is correlated with human flourishing on so many different levels, whether it's life expectancy, GDP per capita, et cetera. So like, frankly, I want, I want Bitcoin to use more energy because it's going to be the global reserve currency of the world. Um, and I want my money supply to be secure. And so I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And furthermore, I, I think we could play up the fact that, you know, Bitcoin mining actually incentivizes more generation and it incentivizes more efficient generation in the sense that if you're a miner and you figure out a novel way to produce energy at scale for cheaper than your competitors, you now have a direct way to monetize it for the first time in history. You don't need to worry about transmission or any other sort of geographic constraints that historically have kind of limited generation. And so you could make the case that that mining itself is going to lead to this revolution in energy production. And we're going to be able to produce more energy at scale for cheaper. And this is something that should be celebrated rather than sort of criticized and condemned. Completely agree with AJ on this. And another big advantage of cryptocurrency mining is, especially in renewable energy like wind farms, it's the production is very volatile. And so by mining Bitcoin, you can actually have those uh, operations run continuously and smooth, uh, smooth out the, the, the production. Uh, what, do, what do you think, uh, electricity producer, how do you think they're approaching this? Um, is it, are, they, are they mining to do that or are they gonna be using contractors? So I mentioned the sort of demand curve uh, or sort of demand uh, sink that Bitcoin can act as. And, and I mentioned that from experience where uh, we have uh, a client that we work with that it was a natural gas plant that would uh, unfortunately have to meet a certain minimal threshold to keep their generators online and the engines running efficiently, meaning that they're not wasting um, gas in, in incomplete combustion. Um, so by running below that threshold, you're polluting uh, quite a bit and running above it, you're minimizing that, but you're also just creating energy that's not going anywhere. And so they've found Bitcoin to be quite a novel solution that they can run this minimal uh, wattage, uh, megawatts to keep their operation online so that when there is demand on the grid that exceeds the uh, you know profit on the Bitcoin side, they're able to scale up their production quite rapidly. And they do this, they, they operate in a space where there's natural disasters and, and the grid sees quite uh, huge swings in demand. And, and so it's been very valuable from them, from their perspective as a power producer, they can keep their core operation and add value to the local community in that way, but at the same time, sort of maximize the profit and smooth out uh, these sort of variances on the production side. Because it takes about 12 hours to get these generators up and running. But if you're running at a base load, you can just flip it and switch it around much faster and, and respond to consumer demand quite a bit uh, faster. So Bitcoin enables them to do this uh, in a way that you know keeps them a, a productive member of their local community, protecting the folks there, but also securing uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, I think those are all good points. I think it's actually very hard in energy markets, my understanding is to actually meet uh, supply and demand, perhaps more challenging than other industries. And Sasha, you brought up wind as one example, and this is actually, yeah, all renewables, it's quite challenging because most renewables are inherently quite intermittent. And so, you know, something like wind energy in Texas, you know, there's there's a lot of it, but wind, is, it's hard to predict and it can occur during points in the day when there actually isn't um, great demand for energy. So, right, like a wind farm at night where it's quite windy, but lights are off, people aren't using air conditioning, people aren't using heating, there's actually, yeah, very limited demand. And so what can actually happen is that energy prices go quite, quite low for the suppliers and, you know, there's, they actually can go negative or, um, yeah, quite cheap. And so if you think about even investing or mining as a way to increase investment into renewables, let's say you, um, you know, add a miner to a situation where, uh, on, to a wind farm where at night it's windy, the wind farm is facing very low electricity prices, but now a miner can provide a stable price floor where the miner can say, sure, we'll always take your electricity when it's you know one cent per kilowatt hour. And maybe that's preferable for the energy producer. And now they 
um, actually increase revenues over, over their alternative. I think another example that has been quite trendy over the last year um, is this idea of mining using flared gas. Um, and I was reading a paper by Nick Carter recently, and he used this term non-rival energy, which I quite liked, which was energy that does not deprive anyone else of energy, nor does it drive up the costs for other downstream consumers. And, and flared natural gas is a great example of that, where miners can come into these situations where natural gas is, is created just as a byproduct of oil production, and then rather than flaring it, use that, use that gas to power Bitcoin miners. And it's, it's an example of you know, it's not actually, it's not impacting any, any downstream consumer, it's reducing flaring, um, and it can be actually quite profitable for, for the miner. And so this is a trend that I think energy producers are going to recognize a lot of these opportunities and become increasingly involved in mining over the next several years. Yeah, just, just to add, we have the same view at Galaxy. Like the, we think the, the energy generation and, and mining industries will really be the same thing in 10 years. And it's for, for the reasons that, that Brian and Jay stated, like as, as a miner, you're economically incentivized to own your own generation because you'll be vertically integrated and you have better margins. As an energy producer, you can add to your revenue by mining instead of selling power to the grid when it's more profitable to do so. And so we're already starting to see the convergence of these two sectors. And I think in, in 10 years time, they're just gonna be the same thing. Everyone's gonna be doing it. Very interesting. And it's that, and that's why it's great to have quite a few miners on this panel today. Um, because so you have the electricity price component of the mining, but then you also have to buy some hardware, you have to put this in, into a facility. Uh, so you have some capex, you have then some opex, you need to operate it, maybe if it's generating a lot of heat, you need to cool it down. Uh, so let's dive a little in, into the economics of, of mining Bitcoin. Um, just a little uh, a little thing on, on the side. Some of you mentioned uh, there, there have been a, a lot of publicly trading company, even on, on NASDAQ. So on NASDAQ, Riot Blockchain went up about five, more than 5,000% this year. Marathon, Digital, even more than 10,000%. Um, what do you think of those figures? Why are these stocks skyrocketing? Why were they, in a sense, discounted? Is it a bubble? Uh, of course, none of this is financial advice, please. Yeah, no investment advice, but um, you see this a lot in traditional commodity industries where uh, public equities kind of act as a levered play on the underlying commodity. You kind of get a little bit of torque there. So very common in the gold industry where, you know, if gold goes up 1%, you could expect uh, gold equities uh, to go up some multiple of that. And so we've seen a beta of around 2.5, uh, you know, on Bitcoin over the past, like a uh, few months here across all the different companies, Riot and Marathon obviously have done extremely well. And that's really a function of uh, when Bitcoin price goes up and hash rate can't keep up because of supply constraints, you know, we're seeing very strong margins from these public miners, uh, increased cash flow and reinvestment. And that reinvestment cycle will just allow them to acquire more machines, raise more capital and continue that cycle and really give them the advantage that we we're talking about uh, in the institutions part uh, earlier today. And so that's just playing out, you know, here and then the other part of that really is like the access to Bitcoin. A lot of retail investors want access to Bitcoin, but it's still relatively hard to buy the underlying. I mean, it's first of all like you have to go sign up for account, do KYC, all of this, and then uh, you can't invest typically in your 401k at least not easily straight into Bitcoin itself. And so um, anything that gives you exposure to Bitcoin, whether that's mining stocks, you know, Grayscale is another example. Those have all done extremely well. So. Uh, the inflows into the mining sector is kind of a result of, of interest from retail to get involved in mining. Yeah. And would anyone have a take on how would you go about valuing a mining company? Yeah, one of the interesting things we've observed is um, the public markets seem to be looking primarily at um, hash rate when they're, you know, assigning valuations to these companies. And so, and, and not even really deployed hash rate, more just kind of publicly announced hash rate that will be online in the next, call it 12 to 24 months. So like, you'll see one of these companies make an announcement that they have contracted with Bitmain or MicroBT for, you know, X number of machines expected to be delivered over the next 12 months and the stock will immediately rip. Um, which I think is interesting, like at least in the past, you would see announcements men mentioning, um, you know, the scale of facilities in terms of megawatts. 
and now we've kind of transitioned to hash rate um, or you know the number of exa hash that, that an operation or a company has being kind of the, uh, the the headline metric that people advertise off of and the market looks to. Yeah, I think this like this valuation piece is tricky because uh, we we all have this like fundamental view on how to value these companies and we'd probably discount future hash rate pretty heavily, uh, especially, you know, if it's being delivered 12 to 18 months out and we don't know what network hash rate will be at that time. But equity markets are incredibly hard to trade right now, not just in mining across all sectors. And so uh, you kind of need to go with the, the market view for now or else you, you probably won't make the right bets. And that market view is just taking future hash rate and putting a multiple on that. And, uh, you know, the, the US listed companies like Ride and Marathon trade at a slight premium to their Canadian and UK counterparts. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the difficulty to get access even to, to that hardware. Um, and I'm sure some of you ha are having going through this right now, you might not be able to talk about it, but uh, I'm sure potentially waiting for exciting, uh, excited for some deliveries to come soon. And as the, the price of Bitcoin shoots up, of course, the cost of getting mining hardware becomes prohibitive and it becomes very difficult to get hold of those ASICs. Um, why is that so? Where is the limitation, and, and how do you get access to to the hardware? Is it just a price point thing? Do you have do you need some kind of privileged relationships? Uh, how do you get access to this hardware at scale? So, I mean, the ASIC market is uh, fascinating from like a uh, study of economics perspective, in that it is brutal supply and demand. Um, you know, the demand for ASICs right now is through the roof. We've seen a lot of great price action on Bitcoin. You know, we were talking about these companies uh, va getting valued on their potential hash rate. Um, you know, it, it's common th a common theme, and, and we saw this uh, slightly differently in 2017. But the way in which ASICs are manufactured, right, it's just silicon. So there are two major foundries uh, in, in the world, and forgive, uh, don't confuse with, with our name, but when we speak of foundries, in this case, Silicon Foundry, TSMC, and Samsung, uh, they only are able to produce so many silicon wafers a year. Um, those wafers tend to go, you know, your computer, your phones, your car, uh, and there's a major supply crunch on that in general. When it comes to uh, mining hardware and mining ASIC specifically, um, it's a very heavy technical lift to develop these. And then once they're developed, you need to go and have Samsung or TSMC produce uh, the, the lower end chipsets for you to then put and assemble into your miner. Uh, what's happening now is that uh, every generation of ASICs has gotten more and more efficient. And that efficiency is gained by reducing the size of the chips itself. So uh, right now we're you know, in the sub 10 nanometer size, which uh, get not getting into the grizzly details, but we're competing with cell phone manufacturers, laptop manufacturers, folks who, you know, Samsung and TSMC know will make money off of the chips that they give them. So they know they're a good customer. Um, but it's also, you know, if you're going to contract with someone, it's a little bit easier to look at Apple and say, yeah, I can give you more allocation because you're Apple versus, you know, some of the Bitcoin mining machine manufacturers. Obviously, it's just, you know, different economies of scale at that point. Uh, but the problem we're facing now is that Bitmain, What's Miner, Canon uh, just can't keep up with the pace of demand with the amount of allocation that they're receiving from the foundries. So they're making as many chips as they can, but the market wants way more than they can produce. Um, and we sort of see it trend as hash rate and price grow. Uh, the demand sort of follows. And then if there were to be you know, a downward trend in price, you'll see hash rate continue to grow because people made bets and bought equipment uh, that isn't going to be delivered for X number of months. And so this hash rate will continue to grow as the price you know, may drop off a cliff. And you see people constantly trying to deploy and recoup what they initially invested in, in, the, in the asset. So it's, it's fascinating. Um, but the long and short of it is, uh, it is a supply and demand constraint at, at the manufacturing level. Yeah, and, and a big part of it, as you mentioned, lies in the economies of scale that you can achieve uh, as by, by the sheer size of, of your operations. So does that bring to you uh, some concerns around the decentralization of Bitcoin? Uh, what, what does it mean? You know, if you're a very 
uh, maybe we can get this uh, Ethan's take on this. You know, what does it mean uh, uh, at a pool level? How are you trying to incentivize the decentralization of the network? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, how you do pool management and governance uh, the way you do this at Fluxor? Yeah, for sure. I, th I think just like taking a step back, though, you can look at decentralization of the network on multiple uh, bases. You can look at it on a geographic basis. So how many countries is the hash rate spread across? You can look at it at the foundry level, which Jay was talking about. You can also look at it on an ASIC manufacturer level. You can look on it at a, a minor hash rate level, and then you can look at it as a pool level. Um, you know, focusing on that pool level, which is one of those verticals, uh, pools are the ones that ultimately determine uh, which transactions go into the block. Um, they're the ones kind of doing a lot of the governance of the Bitcoin network themselves. And so historically, they've been acting as kind of, um, you know, a, a, a I guess, spokesperson for the miners that are connected to their pool. And so I think it's really important for mining pools to uh, have the best interest of the Bitcoin network in mind and uh, consult with uh, the, the miners that they are doing business with and make sure that, you know, that that's kind of reflected. Uh, a recent example of that is Taproot. Um, Taproot is, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be determined by the pools, but the pools need to um, look and see what's in the best interest of their miners that use that platform. And so uh, I think that's an incredibly important piece to it. Um, and it's an important part of, uh, I guess, allowing anyone to mine to uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit here, but uh, back in when Bitcoin started, you could self mine yourself and you can maybe find a block because there weren't that many miners on the network. But as uh, more and more miners join the network, the chances of you finding a block yourself diminished. And so uh, by pulling together resources uh, with slush pool initially, uh, it allowed miners to kind of find more blocks, uh, consistently get paid out as a percentage of their hash rate contribution. And then in 2013, there was a, a large revolution, which was uh, Bitpenny came out with a, a mining pool scheme called Paper Share, which essentially pays miners out on the expected value of hash rate straight up. And in that kind of case, mining pools are essentially acting as a buyer of hash rate. And so miners can get consistent rewards all day long from their mining pool without having to deal with mining luck, which is incredibly important for miners that have large OPEX expenses. And, uh, you know, they want to make sure that their cash flows match up. And so, um, you know, just summing up the, the mining pool business, I think mining pools, you know, need to take into consideration the miners on their platform, but they also just provide like a very vital role to the ecosystem because they allow anyone to come in and, and earn reward, you know, daily. Yeah, and let's dissect this into the institutional part and then the, the retail part. So as an institutional investor is dealing with Bitcoin uh, or cryptocurrencies, what, why, why is it important for you to participate in, in the security of, of the network? Um, and maybe Brian, uh, if there is anything you can share on how Fidelity uh, got into uh looking at mining yeah absolutely i mean we we've been into mining for a long time now over over six years and really when we first began our mining journey it wasn't actually about um earning like generating you know significant revenue being profitable it was about learning what bitcoin is participating directly in this network in this new protocol um, and then because we started early, we were able to get really solid learnings from that. Um, and then it sort of evolved and that's, it's very close to Fidelity Center for Applied Technologies, um, sort of scan, then try, then scale uh, method that, that we follow here. Um, and we're fortunate that, that we, we began that early. Um, but to, to that point, I think increasingly as Bitcoin becomes more and more important at a global level, it will become simultaneously increasingly important for large institutions to have you know, a very strong understanding of what Bitcoin is and to be able to participate quite directly um, in securing something that, that's quite foundational to um, what the financial system could be built on. And so, yeah, just direct participation, building that strong understanding um, is very close to the origins of Fidelity's mining story and was definitely important to us and continues to be important. And and so finish, finishing up on this, how, you know, is there room left for retail? So I mean, my my S nine in the other room says says yes, uh, but that's only because the current economics are are so good. I could turn it back on. Um, you know, there there are teams that are focused on this problem, and and I think it's it's something that should be strongly considered because again, from a decentralization perspective, if it's just institutions mining, then 
you know, it, it, it can get kind of dicey. So, uh, you know, the folks over at Compass uh, work directly with retail miners, helping them source equipment, um, you know, and so I think that's something that needs to be looked at. I mean, I, I got into the mining space back in the GPU days when like that was a, a thing. Um, and I was very much a retail miner, um, but you know, the ASICs and the economies of scale that we've been talking about is just, it's made it very difficult for the individual user to really participate, at least in the mining uh, side of things. And so, I, you know, we're talking about centralization risks and stuff. And I, I think that that ultimately, you know, one of the verticals that, that Ethan mentioned there is the miners themselves. And if the miners themselves are too centralized, then that's ultimately going to, uh, you know, no, no pun intended, but undermine the value of Bitcoin uh, because it's sort of, uh, you know, not not enough cooks in the kitchen in that case, uh, voicing their opinions and, and, you know, participating in that network. Yep. I, I have like a cynical, <laughs> I guess, uh, opinion here that um, there's like a, an idea of like path of least resistance and Right now, it's just incredibly hard for retail to access ASIC markets, and there's new products that can allow people, investors, retail investors, to get access to mining. Uh, so there, there's new hash rate tokens launched by Binance and Poolin, and now Blockstream. Uh, there's the public mining companies, which we talked about earlier. Uh, I think there will be a lot more like hash rate contracts in the future. I mean, we saw an earlier iteration of that with cloud mining, and so I think naturally, as these ASIC markets are just really hard to, to access for retail and it's hard to set up an operation if you're a small miner and you want to spend less than, say, a few hundred thousand, uh, they'll naturally, those, those uh, investments will naturally flow to financialized products. And you're really starting to see that play out in the hash rate token market, which has exploded. And the hash rate tokens trade at around like a 12 to 15 percent premium over ASIC markets now just because they're you know such... Uh, easier markets to access and they also have that exchange grade liquidity in the case you want to exit your mining position which uh, you can do in ASIC mining but it's just a little bit tougher and there's uh, you know you're going to lose out on a bit of money there so I, I think naturally like retail is going to get involved in mining but it's not going to be at the ASIC level at least not on ground scale thanks thanks Ethan uh, so now we have a couple of questions from the public the first one uh, uh, follows on the uh, the Flare, uh, flare gas. So what percentage of flare gas would you estimate could be mitigated by Bitcoin mining within the US in the next decade? I mean, I think the flare gas angle is, is, is fascinating because it also sort of helps with decentralization because instead of having, you know, large power plants with a lot of miners on it, you have these sort of containerized solutions that are dropped in the middle of nowhere, essentially. Um, you know, so that, that's one angle. But in terms of the percentage of flare gas mitigation. It's one of the things that, that we're seeing a lot of demand for right now from our advisory business uh, is that, of course, ASIC constraints being being the main uh, prohib uh, prohibitor right now. But I there's some very large megawatt numbers about how much methane and, and other natural gases are currently being flared. And I, I think from an oil producer perspective, uh, there's strong incentivization to do this because you are able to make your normal profit off of your current, uh, you know, production. You're able to minimize regulatory impact, and you're able to find a new source of revenue from something that was in the past viewed as waste. Um, and then from the ESG side, you're capturing some of the worst pollutants uh, around and transforming them into something incredibly valuable. Um, so I, I think there's a strong incentive, at least in the US to see that. And, and of course the US is very much an oil and gas uh, focused area. So I think we'll see a lot of increased activity in there. I guess one, one I think, comment uh, is for those that are maybe less familiar with, with this type of setup, just to even like visually picture what this looks like. I mean, these are really remote, remote, remote oil fields, right? Where, where flaring occurs and unlike traditional hosting type setups where you could have sort of a massive warehouse that can um, supply many, many megawatts of electricity. These are really, if you can picture like a shipping container essentially that then can supply miners that are inside that essentially shipping container um, anywhere from just a couple hundred kilowatts to maybe two megawatts or so. And so I think one 
potential limiting factor, something that I would just keep an eye on is how does this scale from, you know, a, a megawatt container, and maybe you can, I mean, you can certainly deploy several of these types of containers, but to something that's, you know, hundreds of, of megawatts, um, because that's what would really be necessary to like significantly cut into um, flaring across the country. If, if if you're viewing mining as like the the big thing that is going to cut into uh, flared natural gas. Thanks. And the next question is uh, the comment that consuming energy should be commended is just not true. All else, all less equal, less energy consumption is better than more. Does the rest of the panel agree with the view that somehow energy uh, consumption should be seen favorably? Uh, I, I fully agree with AJ on that. Um, I mean, the reality of human civilization is perpetual increased energy consumption. Um, so for humans to prosper, for us to do more with what we've got, you need energy. Um, you know, agree like that, yeah, it, it's kind of hard to juxtapose the two, but what's really critical to understand here is that it's energy, it's efficient use of the energy, right? So combustion of coal is not as efficient as combustion of natural gas, which is not as efficient as nuclear energy, which is hopefully fusion always 10 years away. Uh, really stoked for that for Bitcoin mining, but that's a separate topic. But you know, the scale at which humans create and generate energy is important to the success of human civilization as a whole. Um, and so, you know, when we think about how energy is used, it needs to be used the most efficient way possible. Minimize the waste product from it, of course. Minimize the transmission loss, which is a very difficult problem to solve. Um, but, you know, your electric car uses the same amount of energy, in theory, as, as your gas vehicle. It's just coming from a different source. And if it's connected to the grid, it could be a coal-fired plant. But you're still consuming energy to get the same amount of work done. It's just a matter of efficiency. Um, and I think it's really important to think in terms of efficiency versus raw numbers. I agree with Jay and uh, AJ here. I think as, as a human civilization, we be, should be striving for unlimited energy. Um, obviously, we, we want to reduce the, the amount of externalities that come with the production of that energy and, and usage of it. But our end goal as a human civilization should be unlimited energy, unlimited, clean, renewable energy. Thank you guys so much for this really uh, insightful panel. Uh, this conversation always pops up kind of like Sasha was mentioning energy consumption with Bitcoin, but I think hopefully people watching um, have been educated on why it's beneficial that Bitcoin consumes the energy it does. Um, so thank you so much.